Thank you for coming tonight. My name is Peter Gagne, and spoiler alert, I worked on the lunar module, and it's my pleasure to give you some insight as to how it was built. So tonight, title of tonight's presentation is Building Apollo's Lunar Module 50 Years Ago. It just seems like a few days ago that I worked on it, but unfortunately, that's not the reality. Here's a nice um, artist's conception of the lunar module along with its uh, individual mission patches. And you may have seen the Apollo mission patches, but the lunar module had its own, and they were distinct for each of the lunar modules, starting from LEM-3, 4, LEM-5 is the uh, module that went with Apollo 11 that landed on the moon, as did LEM-6, LEM-7 was a rescue ship for Apollo 13, and so on. NASA's commemorating the 50-year event with this beautiful uh, new logo, which we're proud to use. And they're looking forward to the next leap forward in the next 50 years. I'd like to be around to see it, but I'm not sure I will. So quick back in history, 1958, NASA was born as an act of uh, Congress and at the uh, bequest of Dwight Eisenhower. Contrary to popular opinion, John F. Kennedy did not establish NASA. A very brief chronology on the Apollo program, 1960, uh, NASA officially announced that we were going to go to the moon. 1961, they completed the lunar landing study. Six, July of 61, they requested proposals from the industry on the various aspects of the project. In November, in the fall of uh, 61, NASA awarded the major contract to North American Aviation. And in 62, NASA decided that a lunar rendezvous mode would be the way to get to the moon, as opposed to an all-in-one shot, which was a big matter of discussion up to this point. And where I come in, in November 62, NASA awarded the lunar module contract to Grumman. So in 1962, you can see that the lunar module didn't look exactly like what it looked when it went to the moon, but it's, uh, it was in a state of evolution. And at this point in time, John F. Kennedy and Lyndon Johnson jumped on the bandwagon and were very happy to be seen in Houston with one of the early modules. And some people may be surprised to know that the lunar module, the second half of the Apollo program, was built only 100 miles from here in Bethpage, Long Island, by the Grumman Aircraft Corporation. And uh, this view of the campus shows two of the major buildings involved in the LEM project. The Building 25, which is a three-story newly erected building, where the engineering went on and a refurbished plant five where the actual assembly, final assembly and test of lunar modules occurred. During the peak of, of its employment in 1969, Grumman had um, almost 35,000 employees around the country. Grumman was not a new name in aviation by any means. Um, they go back to the 30s and built you know, 17, between 17 and 20,000 aircraft for military and coast guards in the United States and around the world. Some of the examples are the Hellcat from World War II, the Panther in the 1950s, the beautiful Albatross search and rescue that was used by coast guards, the S2E submarine tracker, the EA-6B electronic warfare plane, we'll hear a little bit more about that. And then the F-14 Tomcat, the real star of Top Gun movie. <laughs> Interesting note, the aircraft in dark navy blue, which looks black on the screen, with underlined in red, a Grumman Panther, was the same type that Neil Armstrong flew in the 1950s when he was in the Navy. I found this old poster which kind of summed up my feeling on engineers 
involved in an aviation and says every aviation activity is but the length and shadow of the engineer. And certainly the lunar module was a shadow of one particular from an engineer, and his name was Tom Kelly, a very brilliant man with a, um, actually a doctorate degree in engineering. And in my career in engineering, um, running into engineers with doctorates are very, very scarce. The picture shown here on the lower left is him working on a proposal for the space shuttle which Grumman actually bid on unsuccessfully. But he was a very modest man besides being brilliant, and the underlying statement says that uh, although he was called Mr. Lem, I got my name in the papers, but an awful lot of other people did the work. It's a typical self-deprecating engineer. New York Times actually had a cover story on a Sunday edition and they said it looks like a Martian and it will land our men on the moon. And what's very interesting as the New York Times take a very positive attitude that it used the word it will land our men on the moon, not attempt to land our men on the moon. So I thought that was interesting. I have two of these copies going back to 1969. So a view of the lunar module, um, I call it form following function, that's an architectural term where the actual purpose of an article determines its physical shape and size. In this case, the mission of the lunar module determines its physical size and shape. It was only 23 feet high, 14 feet in diameter, and uh, rather unlike most spacecraft you would have imagined, but because there's no atmosphere to cause wind resistance on the moon, there's no need to streamline it. And as a matter of fact, because the astronauts were only in it for a very short time, there were no seats. So it only contained the absolute necessary equipment to perform its function in space. As you probably know, the, their LEM was built in two parts, an ascent and a descent stage. The top part being the ascent stage and the bottom being the descent, as you would imagine. And this is sort of a semi-inside um, view, and I showed with a red arrow where the crew actually occupies its workstations. A very small area, about six by six by six, and that was fine for two astronauts, but you will remember that in Apollo 13 it was occupied by three. So imagine three people in a cube, six by six by six, for an extended period of agonizing <laughs> worry. Um, the ascent stage weighed 11,000 pounds on Earth, but of course, anybody want to guess what it weighed on the moon? One-sixth of that, something like that. And the descent stage weighed double that, 22,000 pounds with uh, 6,000 pounds of fuel. And just to give you an idea of the scale, the landing gear is about 30 feet diagonally. Uh, and the two stages were held together by only four bolts. And uh, they were explosive bolts, that is, a, an explosive charge disconnected them so that the two stages could demate and uh, the ascent stage could go back and rejoin the command module when the mission was over. So how do you build a, a lunar module? Well, Grumman published a small brochure and um, we'll take some excerpts from that. The first one being an overview of the lunar module. I hope you can see in the upper left uh, the actual cockpit area and the, um, the dark shaded portion are the skins that surround the, uh, the crew compartment and the darkest part of the upper right is where the um, astronauts came out through the hatch and they call that the front porch. I think I can use a pointer here. That was what they call the front porch that they sat on just before they came down the ladder. 
But as you can see, the, um, the, the inside of the lunar module had uh, four windows, I think, basically. Um, two, in, two looking down on the front, two looking up uh, towards, the, uh, towards the command module when they were, when they were docking. And the, um, the mission commander had one set of controls, and the lunar module pilot had another set of controls. They could obviously work the main controls uh, together by reaching over one another, since there were no seats. But basically, the um, mission commander was there to fly the lunar module down to the surface of the moon. So, back in the days before Xerox had made a, a very large format copy machine, we used something called blueprints. And talk about ancient history, the blueprint was actually invented in 1842 by Sir John Herschel, who was not only a mathematician, but an astronomer, a tie-in to McCarthy Observatory. Uh, the paper was treated with a photosensitive material, the original in black and white was put on top, and an image came out in reverse, giving it the name of a blueprint, this one of the top assembly of a lunar module. So the mechanical assembly of a lunar module, this is what you'd call an exploded, again an exploded view of the ascent stage here and the descent stage. You'll notice that the ascent stage is sort of circular in design, whereas the descent stage is pretty much rectangular. And again, that's a situation where form follows function. The um, literature here mentioned several times that the uh, cabin skins were fabricated by a, a chemical milling process, which was unique in the aviation industry at the time. Again, this is 50 years ago. Normally, complicated um, parts of an aircraft or spacecraft were built piece by piece and riveted together, bolted together. But in this case, they decided to use a fairly new process called chemical milling. And this is the science part of the, the show. When you place uh, an aluminum sheet, which is largely what a spacecraft is made of, into a bath of sodium hydroxide, it eats it away. Now, that's not very productive, you think, except if you mask it in certain places where you don't want to be eaten away. And in that case, you can machine away or mill away the areas that are not necessary for the function of that part, thereby reducing weight and still retaining strength. So you can continue the process in several steps by several types of masks and different exposure times into the solution and the sodium hydroxide will eat away the aluminum to form complex functions like reinforcements or parts of the rib. So here's a quick overview of how a modern uh, chemical etching process would, would go along. A technician has applied a chemical mask to a sheet of aluminum. That's a rubberized surface that attaches to the surface and blocks the action of the uh, sodium hydroxide. The sheet with the mask on is placed in the uh, caustic solution. Those bubbles are there to stop the bulk of the uh, liquid from evaporating. And it's heated to a certain uh, temperature to accelerate the process. And then once the sheet is removed, washed, the mask is taken off. And as you can see, most of the material has been etched away leaving a web which is very strong and suited for the purpose. <coughs> this is not particularly an aircraft skin, but it's just indicative of the process that, uh, that was used. So here's another view of the, uh, the ascent stage. Again, I said it was cylindrical, very similar to an aircraft fuselage, and the red crew compartment arrow shows you how small an area the two astronauts had in this, uh, this spacecraft once it was put together. 
and some of the salient features including a front hatch that's where Neil Armstrong came out of to go down to the moon. It had a top hatch is how the uh, lunar module attached to the command and service module and skins obviously to strengthen and to prevent um, you know to give it strength in in uh, in its mission. Some of the more detailed shots of the, the assembly of the ascent stage. In this case, it's the Lunar Module 9, which is one I know that I worked on. Shows you that um, by the size of the uh, the workers here, you can get an idea of uh, about how big that is. And that's that area there is, is again the crew compartment, and that's the front hatch. The parts were held together temporarily by fixtures, which are these large white beams that are going across so as to put the parts in proper alignment and uh, otherwise by the time you get from the front to the back the back wouldn't fit on so you need what you call fixtures to uh, to establish a correct plumb uh, situation for all of the, uh, the assemblies um, this is another uh, shot of the ascent stage and this, the detail inset is one of the workmen putting the uh, skins on to the side of the ascent stage. And they did it the old-fashioned way by drilling, hand drilling with a, uh, an air-powered drill and bucking rivets for the most part. A sealant was put on the parts before the, um, the rivets were bucked to make the joints airtight. The descent stage, on the other hand, was, as I say, more rectangular. Looks more like a house construction than a spacecraft. It had vertical and vertical members and horizontal members. Uh, we call them stringers, horizontal stringers. And uh, the second set of workmen, are, uh, this guy here, is actually drilling a hole in landing gear to put one of the fixtures on one of the out outboard struts that will go on the, on the descent stage. But very technology very similar to what uh, Grumman had used in building thousands and thousands of aircraft in the past. Once the two stages got to a certain point, the dirty work uh, was somewhat finished and moved to a cleaner area. That's why now you'll see the workmen rather in flannel shirts, they're wearing white smocks and white caps. Uh, in this photograph here, they're test fitting uh, the landing gear for the, uh, for the lunar module and it's actually partially covered with some uh, thermal insulation. Some of the final work that's to be done on the mechanical assembly is, uh, is plumbing up the propulsion on the descent stage. In this case you'll see the tanks, but this area in the center is where the descent engine would be, and that's that went on as one of the last items in the build. The landing gears were attached uh, in four corners, as you would imagine. Um, these little devices that seem to stick out from um, the landing pads, anybody guess what those are? Lunar contact. Yes, lunar contact probes. And there were three of them, and this um, <coughs> this diagram, along with several other artist conceptions, incorrectly shows that there was one that there were four. There was not one on the leg where the ladder from uh, the inside compartment would be. Apparently, they were afraid that that would interfere if it broke off or something with the uh, with the landing gear assembly. So there were three uh, lunar contact uh, uh, devices. Because the, uh, many, many people worked inside the spacecraft and doing its assembly, bringing a lot of debris and um, uh, pieces of metal extraneous to, uh, to their work inside, each stage, both the ascent and descent, was put on a rotary table, and we referred to it as a shake and bake, of course. Uh, we had no respect at all, but it was amazing how much um, 
debris did come out uh, of each of the stage, including, unfortunately, Workman's tools. And shortly after that, Workman stopped putting their names on tools. <laughs> no surprise. <laughs> the, um, some of the final mechanical assembly would be the attachment of the outer skins to the spacecraft. And in the case of the ascent stage on top, they used an extensive erector set of outriggers or tubular space frame to attach the skins to. These skins really didn't do anything uh, for the mission other than pr cover the thermal blankets and protect, uh, do some protection for micrometeorites, which we'll show here. The shield, which uh, consisted here of the, the aluminum outside skin was attached to the actual cabin frame by a series of standoffs, these devices here, and spaced both the shield and the thermal blanket at the proper distance from the cabin wall. This little red arrow shows a typical, hopefully never larger than a pinhead micrometeorite, impinging on the shield, breaking up losing some energy in the aluminum shield, then being caught by some additional layers of the uh, thermal blanket. And um, detail of that is shown here. This is the aluminum shield on the outside. It also had some very interesting uh, inconel and nickel uh, plating to it as a, as a, as a, once again, as a micrometeorite shield. And then two blankets of uh, polyimide, uh, very thin, very, very thin mylar, uh, aluminized uh, material, which was intentionally crinkled up to cause it not to uh, push together. You may have seen when someone builds a house properly, they fluff the insulation in the air spaces in the walls, and that ha this has the same uh, same effect by make, making the aluminized sheets stand away from one another, it gives a higher R value. Okay, so this is the campus of um, the Grumman Aircraft Corporation in Bethpage, Long Island, where I work. Just to show you that they devoted two of, two of their biggest um, plants, plant uh, three here, to build the ascent stage, plant two for the descent stage, and then plant five for the final assembly. Uh, we did have a runway, it was 5,000 feet long, almost oh, a little more for a mile long, and that's how the lunar modules were shipped to uh, Cape <coughs> Kennedy. So here you see a lunar module being installed in a, beginning to be installed in a test station for some of its uh, checkout, final checkout. I indicated that um, the building was approximately three stories tall. So here there are windows on the mezzanine. That's where technicians and engineers like myself worked to actually perform an electronic checkout of the lunar, lunar module so as not to get in the way of uh, the average uh, mechanical technician who was working on the platform at the time. But there is an air hose here um, to maintain a positive pressure in the cabin area to stop d dust from settling. It also brought in air because there are always at least one technician in the lunar module if the test was going on because he had to set the switches, circuit breakers, and controls that were required for the uh, test phase. The crinkly bubbly stuff here is of course the thermal, the thermal blanket. Um, again, that's the descent stage, and there's the, um, there's the engine. And you can see it's sitting on, on a platform, and there are actually wheels here that this is, uh, this is wheeled around. At a later time, the scaffolding would be completed 360 degrees at all these levels, so people could walk around safely without falling off and connect cables, adjust 
um, the engines, um, locate different parts on there and, and do the necessary testing and troubleshooting. The Plant 5 overall was a fairly large building. It was 250 feet long, 80 feet wide, and as I say, 30 feet, 35 feet high, about three stories. It could accommodate three ascent stages in progress of work, two descent stages, and three integrated ascent and descent stages. And typically, uh, in, from the 1966 on to 1972, you would see three lunar modules being in various stages of construction. So what did it take to test a lunar module? Well, this is a typical group, a team that was assigned to lunar module. Um, these, are, um, these are above and beyond the people that actually did the mechanical assembly, uh, the hydraulic assembly, uh, all the bucking of rivets. These are people that are just doing the final test inspection and check out. And there's one funny looking guy down here. I don't know. Um, I, I think I, I think it's me. So I got in, uh, you know, I may have may not made it to all of the rehearsals, but I got in the, you know, the curtain call. But one might ask how I was so fortunate, and it was all about timing. When I graduated from college in 1966, Grumman unfortunately had been falling far behind on their schedule. And when I started looking for a job in the summer, they started looking for engineers. And and this is the days when the dinosaurs roamed free. There, were no, there was no internet, there's no Facebook, there's no LinkedIn, there's no chat sites. We used things called newspapers. And Grumman put double page ads in all the major New York City newspapers, which one of which I read, and responded to their open uh, interviews one Saturday. So I drove my little Triumph TR3 from Bronx to Bethpage, which is pretty good trip for a beat up old TR3. Uh, it actually didn't lose any parts on the way, which was pretty, pretty major accomplishment for a British car of that era. And I had uh, several interviews with Grumman engineers. And by the time I got home, the phone was ringing, giving, making me an offer I couldn't refuse. And I started either that following Monday or the Monday, one Monday later. So the life of a test engineer was kind of a split personality. He had to be in two places, unfortunately fortunately not at the same time, but in the engineering building we had to review communication specifications, develop test plans, write operational check procedures, analyze data, determine probable causes for failures, and uh, come up with remedies. And on the, when we weren't there, we were actually performing the uh, the measurements and testing, in my case it was the communication systems, troubleshooting problems with their performance, uh, directing any replacement of assemblies that had failed, causing the, um, the problems, and assisted in the final operation checkout procedure, which was documents that NASA used to assure that the lunar module met their contract specification. My work schedule was typically 12 hours a day, seven days a week, and one day off in 14. Why one day off in 14? Because New York State labor law required that you couldn't work more than 13 days in a row. So, and just for fun, every two weeks, they shifted us from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. to 8 p.m. to 8 a.m. Just for the heck of it. You know, just when you're getting used to that schedule, where lunch was at midnight and breakfast was at dinner time, you had to go backwards. Okay. So job one was to read a lot of manuals and become <coughs> completely familiar with the, in my case, communication systems. And this is just a, a few of the manuals that were expected to understand. And of course, we actually needed to get a physical understanding of where the equipment was located. In this case, uh, on the ascent stage, the majority of the communications equipment was located. There was a dish antenna that communicated back to Earth, uh, VHF antennas that communicated to the command module and also to 
uh, extravehicular activity astronauts. There was a portable TV camera. And once they got on the moon, uh, a large dish antenna that was shaped like an umbrella that was stowed in the descent stage area to which uh, provided a lot more gain and for the transmitted signal uh, of the um, uh, television signals which takes up a lot of bandwidth. Okay, um, just a quick block diagram of the communication systems. Many, many antennas. Uh, there were two in-flight VHF antennas, one for the extravehicular activity. There were two in-flight um, S-band antennas and one trackable one to help uh, amplify the signal on the way to the Earth. All of the equipment was, uh, was redundant. Uh, all of these, these boxes, um, whether they were VHF or uh, microwave, had dual capabilities and they all fit into basically the earphones and microphone of the astronauts helmets and there was of course telemetry that was transmitted also this was just this is a, again not a schematic but just another basic diagram of the communication system a schematic of uh, the actual electronics would be uh, many, many, many feet wide, so you couldn't see it on a, a screen like this. Quickly, the S-Band Unified uh, plan said that uh, we would use uh, one signal at 2 gigahertz to transmit voice, uh, telemetry, and uh, tracking, and velocity data. Prior to this, other missions uh, had used multiplicity of wavelengths and frequencies, MIT decided that they could do it as a unified system, which uh, enormously um, simplified the communications and the tracking between Earth and the spacecraft. Most of the communications were from a very large telescope, a radio telescope antennas in California, Australia, and Spain with some backups in Africa and other countries. And it was coordinated in Greenbelt, Maryland. So here's the, the quick overview of the communications path. Again, the unified S-band voice range and data between, say, the command module and the Earth, the lunar module and the Earth at two gigahertz, and between the lunar module and the command module at VHF at 300 megahertz. You might ask, how do we measure the speed of the, speed craft, uh, the spacecraft? Well, our old friend, the Doppler effect, was used. And the velocity of the lunar module and the command module together is equal to the speed of light multiplied by the change in frequency divided by the source frequency. So basically, it's the same way that you use Doppler radar to, to determine how fast a car is going from a police uh, radar, handheld radar, only this is done on a very large scale. As you can see, the one on Goldstone, California, that's probably an 85-foot uh, antenna that we're, we're talking about. Fun fact, the radio transmissions in space travel at the speed of light, which is 186,000 miles per second in the rational world, or 300,000 kilometers per second in the science world. And since the distance from Earth and Moon on the average is 240,000 miles, it takes about 1.3 seconds to go one way. So it's about 2.3 seconds round trip. The range of the spacecraft was even more difficult to establish. So again, MIT came up with a pseudo-random noise code methodology where they broadcast on the uplink channel a long series of bits, uh, binary digits, that did not repeat for a very long time. The lunar module, or the command module, returned those in their downlink signals, and by matching up the phase of the bits going up versus coming down, they had an extremely accurate determination of the range of the spacecraft from the Earth. So my first job 
on the lunar module around, I guess, November 1966, was to do some on-hand attenuation measurement of the coax cable from up here in the, um, the mezzanine to down here in the spacecraft. I was up in the mezzanine, my colleague was down there on the spacecraft. He, by intercom, he asked me to adjust the RF generator to a certain power level. He measured it at the um, with a power meter down by the spacecraft and using the, for the following f formula, 10 log power out, power in, we determined the attenuation, the coax cable. And sometimes the cable attenuation was infinite, meaning it was broken. So we'd have to find out where it was broken. And we used a device called a time domain reflectometer, which is still in use today, mostly for fiber optic networks. But basically it sends a pulse. Uh, in our case, it was a radio frequency down the cable and measured its reflections. And it displayed the reflected signal on the, the visual part of the oscilloscope. And the readout actually measured the distance from the scope to the fault, which eliminated us having to route through every bit of cables inside the raceways, on the work stands, and did a lot of, um, it was a lot of help not having to violate the uh, thermal blankets and the, the skins of the aircraft if possible because they were fragile and um, took a lot of time to replace them. So we were able to use this effectively to, um, to shorten our time for troubleshooting things as, as simple as broken wires or un unconnected cables. The rest of the S-band equipment um, took enormous amounts of, uh, of electronics to, to, uh, to test. There were microwave receivers, VHF receivers, spectrum analyzers, generators, you name it. Uh, they were stored in racks, although this is not a picture of the equipment we use. It's typical of the large volume of equipment that, uh, that was necessary to test uh, just one subsystem, the communication subsystem for the uh, lunar module. So as the program progressed and uh, 1969, I was asked to uh, work on the radar system, and, um, which I did. There are two radar systems on the lunar module. One is the rendezvous radar, which is used to hook up the lunar module and the command module in space. And that's shown in the upper part here. And this is a nice view of how the how the astronauts stand up in the spacecraft. And the landing radar, which is located down in the bottom, which is a pretty clever place to, you know, put it since, you know, that's kind of pointing down where you're going to be. Um, and, you know, the interesting thing about the landing radar was, on, was used a very short time, but it was an absolutely critical part of the mission. And it was during the last phases of the descent where it became extremely important to know your downward velocity and, uh, and position. So how the landing radar did this was uh, with actually four transmitters. One was with a, a velocity transmitter, which again used our old friend the Doppler method of determining the um, frequency change in the transmitted to receive signal. And then for its uh, positioning and, and uh, sideways movement, it used three beams of transmitted signal and three receivers and measured uh, the phase difference between those, those three signals with a very, uh, very interesting uh, computer algorithm in the primary guidance and navigation system. The readouts for those are on the altimeter, as you would imagine, for the, uh, for the altitude. And the XY pointers that both the uh, commander and the mission special and, um, and the uh, lunar module pilot had at their um, disposal. The X pointer showed your forward and lateral velocity. Um, and these, as a backup, these devices could be switched between 
the landing radar and the primary guidance and navigation system, which was an inertial platform, typical of what aircraft use. And we probably heard a lot about um, these words in the last couple of weeks, 40 feet down to two and a half, forward, forward, two and a half down, four forward. These, um, these words all came from these two readouts, the altimeter and the, ex the cross pointer from the landing radar. So that is basically until the, um, until the contact light came on, that's how they knew where they were. So in 1968, we'll go quickly here, uh, first lunar module flew, it was unmanned. Um, the company was, uh, Grumman was so large, we had our own newspaper, it was called the Grumman Plain News, and I'll show you some excerpts from uh, our coverage from that, rather than newspaper or archival coverage. And the um, Lunar Module 1 had been in manufacturing since 1966, and it was shipped on June 67. So there, you can see there's a pretty big time delay between when you start a spacecraft, when it's shipped, and when it's actually launched. Now 1969, I call this the age of Aquarius, and children may want to ask their grandparents what this means, but it was a time of love and peace, and I think it's um, where love will guide the stars, and um, we'll have a happy ending, which hopefully was a good omen for the first Apollo mission, manned mission LEM-3, in March of 69. Again, the Grumman Plain News said, mission accomplished, and the Spider, along with Gumdrop, did an Earth orbital mission with uh, McDivitt, Scott, and Schweikert. LEM-4 celebration poster, which is he not only here, but also hanging up here. Uh, Grumman put this out, had the astro two astronauts sign it, and the negative actually went on the spacecraft and came back and was given to the individuals who worked on LEM-3. Preparing for LEM-4 and Apollo 10 was pretty exciting, um, and that was shipped to Kennedy Space Center in 1968, and actually took off in May 1969. <coughs> There's the mission patch for, for LEM-4, and the Apollo uh, 10 mission patch uh, for the uh, Apollo program where Snoopy is looking at the moon so close, but he can taste it, but unfortunately that was not their mission. It was LEM-5 that we, of course, know, and Apollo 11 was the one that landed on the moon, and that's our patch, LEM-5 patch, with the Apollo 11 patch side by side. Our coverage in the Grumman Plain News had the same essentially headline that just about every other newspaper did, One Small Step for Man, and uh, showing Aldrin at the, uh, at the equipment bay after he had landed. And these pictures show the emotions of our employees uh, at the reaction of the landing of Apollo 11. Um, so, you know, a lot of laughter, shouting, crying, and uh, after a successful mission, a breath of relief uh, for a job well done. So LEM-6, another air spacecraft that I worked on, and Apollo 12 followed right up in November 1969 with Conrad Gordon Bean in the Intrepid uh, with a longer, longer mission stay. Here's the LEM-6 uh, Grumman uh, signature plaque that's up also on the wall there. It's a small 8x10 photograph. And a um, couple of interesting signatures. One is uh, Tom Kelly, who I think you remember from the early part of the presentation, designed the spacecraft. And somebody down here who decided to get on uh, the bandwagon and sign it also uh, as being part of, the, part of the team. This is the LEM-6 internal uh, patch that uh, this was circulated for some of the test engineers to sign, which I can crack at also. So remember when I said it was the age of Aquarius, uh, and I'd be back to that, 
by uh, interesting irony, Aquarius was the name given to Lem 7, and in January 1970, the souls of Apollo 13 crew were saved by using Aquarius as their lifeboat. So what goes around comes around. Towards the end, Lem 12, um, the last lunar module to fly, um, shows still a dedicated crew of people uh, as, as, um, as they're about to ship the lunar module to uh, Cape Kennedy. There was an LM-13 fabricated, but it was never flown. Um, and um, just a quick picture of LM-12 in June 71 being sent down to the Cape. And a cover of the Grumman Plain News on December 21st of 72, showing the crew of uh, Apollo 17, Cern and Evans and Schmidt, taking off for the moon on the Lunar Module Challenger. And the bottom line says, Grumman team not only lived history, but we made it too. So everybody got a certificate of participation, uh, along with a layoff slip. <laughs> so, <laughs> So in, 19, in, in 1970, I took an assignment uh, on another Grumman program doing electronic countermeasures uh, test equipment uh, for the Prowler, which uh, remained in Navy aviation f until, until very recently. And in 1973, I, I left Grumman uh, to pursue other works. Just as a follow-up, 1994, Grumman merged with uh, Northrop to become Northrop Grumman. And in 2013, out of the 39,000 employees, there were 550 left in Long Island. And in the greatest of irony, the historic Plant 5, where the lunar modules were built, is now a film stage to make motion pictures. So everything that has a beginning has an end. And Snoopy, the unofficial mascot of the Apollo program, is holding the sign that says the end on the last slide. And I thank you for your attention, and uh, please come back for another Second Saturday presentation. Thanks.